And welcome all to the panel session on the political economy of the Abe government and economics reforms. My name is Kyotaro Tsutsui, and I'm the director of the Japan program here at the Shorenstein Asia Pacific Research Center at Stanford University. I am delighted to host this event to discuss the book uh, edited by Takeo Hoshi and Philip Lipsey entitled The Political Economy of the Abe Government and Economics Reforms. Uh, this is a project that was studied and developed here at APOC, and it is very fitting for the project to culminate in this uh, edited volume and to come back to Stanford. And we are fortunate to have presentations of three of the best chapters in the volume, and uh, we have six speakers today. So I wanna make sure that I get out of the way as quickly, quickly as possible and turn it over to the wonderful speakers that we have today. Uh, I'll introduce them briefly and then we'll have uh, their presentations. And then we'll have a Q&A session. So please, uh, audience, please submit your questions using the Q&A function of Zoom. And I'll be sure to ask as many of them as uh, the time allows. Now, the two editors of the volume are friends of APOC, having been here for years, and uh, many in the audience are probably familiar with their work and their face. Uh, first, Takeo Hoshi was the director of the Japan program until a couple of years ago, and he has now moved back to Tokyo and is professor of economics at the University of Tokyo. Uh, University of Tokyo is like Japan entire, uh, in its entirety is lucky to have the leading scholar of the Japanese economy in the world back in the fold. Uh, Philip Lipsy is the, uh, the editor of the volume and Philip was a key member of the Japan program and the political science department here. And he's now a associate professor of political science at the University of Toronto, uh, where he is also the director of the Center for the Study of Global Japan at the Munch uh, School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. So Takeo uh, will speak first to talk about the overall project and the volume, and Philip will make some closing remarks about the volume, linking the Abe era to the current uh, Suga era. And in between those two, we'll have a pleasure of hearing about three key chapters of the volume. And first, we'll hear about uh, innovation from Kenji Kushida, who has been a research scholar at the Japan program here spearheading a number of exciting projects at APOC around innovation, entrepreneurship, and Silicon Valley. And then we'll hear about agricultural policies in Japan from Patty McLachlan, who is professor of Japanese studies at the University of Texas at Austin, and Kei Shimizu, research assistant professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, the two leading experts on the topic. And last but not least, we'll have Trevor Inserti, a PhD student at Yale Political Science, who has already accomplished as much as any junior faculty at top institution and is a rising star in the Japan political science scene, uh, along with Philip Lipsy again, who is a, a already risen star in the Japanese uh, political science scene. Uh, so without any further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Takeo. Please, Takeo. Okay, thank you, Kiyo, very much for the introduction. And uh, as Kiyo mentioned, uh, th this, is, uh, th this, this is actually the first of several book launch events that we will be doing in the next couple of months. And as Kiyo mentioned, it is only fitting to start this at APOC at Stanford. Uh, Philip and I were colleagues at the Japan program at APOC, and we came up with the idea of an uh, edited volume on the po politics and economic policy of the Abe administration, which was changing Japanese politics and policy making and implementing various economic reforms while maintaining the popularity. So we have recruited top scholars, uh, or some, some of whom uh, you will see today, uh, who does the research on Jap Japan's politics, uh, international relations, and uh, or economics and ask them to write original papers on the subject of their expertise during the Abe administration or under the Abe administration. And we received uh, financial as well as staff support from FSI and APOC and held two conferences for, for, this, uh, for, for this project. So I want to repeat my gratitude for APOC, FSI, and Stanford. And I would also like to thank 
uh, Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership and Japan Society for Promotion of Sciences for the financial support for this project here as well. Now, at this point, uh, let me share a slide. So let me share a couple of slides to introduce the book briefly. Uh, this was taken from uh, this is taken from a marketing material prepared by the Cambridge University Press. Uh, so we have a cover of the book on the left and some description of the book. Uh, while you go through the description of, of, the, of the book, uh, let me add that this book is dedicated to the memory of Professor Masahiko Aoki, who was the founder of Today Japan program at APOC, which Kiyo directs now. Uh, he was a mentor and a colleague for both Philip and I, and also Kenji, who will be talking about his chapter later today. He was, Masa was a pioneer who really created the study of the Japanese political economy as we know it today. And also we started this book, this book project after he passed away. We hope this work fits the intellectual path that Masa originated. Uh, you will get a glimpse of some chapters, three chapters of this book today, but we don't have time to cover the entire book. So uh, I'm sure you will want to buy a copy with a 20% discount. Uh, let me briefly go over the list of contents of the book. So just to give you an idea uh, how wide the range of uh, topics that, I, that, that we cover in this book. Uh, after the introductory chapter by Philip and me in chapter one, part two, discusses the politics and policy making under the Abe administration. The chapters in this part discuss how the strengthening of the prime minister's power uh, that already started before Abe accelerated under Abe, how and why Abe and LDP maintained the popularity and how Abe's seemingly disastrous first tenure as prime minister in 2006 and 2007, actually this, this was the second time Abe became the prime minister in 2012, but uh, before that he had the first Abe administration and uh, that ended only uh, within a year, but uh, uh, this, uh, a chapter in this uh, part two actually argues that disastrous period uh, prepared the seeds for Abenomics reform. Part three then examines macroeconomic policy or the first two arrows of Abenomics for those who are familiar with the concept of Abenomics. The chapters in this part uh, discuss the important effects of expansionary monetary and fiscal policy, or in some cases with the lack of uh, intended effects of these uh, macroeconomic policies. And part four turns to the structural reform or the third arrow of abnomics. And today we hear from the authors of chapters 13, 14, 15 on innovation policy, agricultural reform and energy and the environmental policy. The other chapters in this part discusses labor policy, uh, especially womenomics, uh, focusing on uh, women's empowerment in the labor market and corporate governance reform. And finally, the last two chapters look at defense and diplomacy, di diplomacy under uh, Abe administration. For these two chapters, um, we will be holding another book launch, book launch event, inviting the authors to both University of Toronto and the University of Tokyo at the same time, uh, which is possible only online. And uh, I guess I should have invited the University of Texas as well to make it a three UT event, but uh, we didn't do that. But uh, we, we will be holding uh, the, uh, another book launch event on February 25th at the University of Toronto and the University of Tokyo. So if you're interested in foreign policy, you, uh, you, you want to catch that event as well. So now uh, I will let Kenji start by talking about his chapter uh, in this book on Abe's innovation policy.
Uh, Kenji, it's all yours. Great, thank you very much. It's delightful to be part of uh, this group and be part of this volume. Uh, so innovation is very critical for all sorts of things. Uh, for example, I need some serious innovation uh, for the title of my uh, uh, talk here and my book chapter. It's uh, extremely specific, but lacks any sort of punch. Uh, so Abenomics in Japan's entrepreneurship and innovation is the third arrow pointed in the right direction for global competition in the Silicon Valley era. So the question is right there in the title. And uh, the uh, other apology other than my title that I have is that I'm going to go a bit fast, but the good news is you can read the book afterwards. So uh, preamble, J one of the long standing issues in Japan's political uh, economy was its lack of ability of uh, continuity in economic strategic policy until the administration of uh, the second time that uh, Abe uh, Shinzo came along. It was really, really difficult to have coherency because if you look at down here, uh, clearly a large number of prime ministers in, uh, let's say, 2006 to 2012, that's eight prime ministers in six and a half years, including the fall of the LDP, the rise of the DPJ, uh, the fall of the DPJ, the rise of the LDP. And so policy continuity was difficult. And before that, if we count, from 1986 to 2012, we have 19 prime ministers in 26 years. So uh, given that Prime Minister Abe's tenure was extremely long uh, and he started off with specific long-term strategy initiatives, well, this was uh, a good step forward. So startup ecosystem, why are we interested in startup ecosystems? My argument is that it adds critical flexibility uh, to Japan's large firm dominated economy. That's the role of the maturing, growing startup ecosystem in Japan. And I'm writing a separate book about this, almost done. So this chapter is uh, growing out of some of that. So uh, here, even if startups in Japan don't actually replace the incumbent large firms like they do here in Silicon Valley, they can be really important by allowing much faster shifts in incumbent large firms strategies. By shifting the large firms, then the startup uh, ecosystem can impact the entire uh, set of large firm dominated strategies, which can be a good thing for growth. For example, banks uh, can't do a lot of things by themselves, but by partnering with fintech, uh, they can offer all sorts of things that uh, consumers might need in manufacturing and sensors. Uh, the sensors can be provided by uh, startups as well as AI, or there are examples of exciting examples of construction firms using drones and intelligence augmentation to upskill inexperienced workers, or using drones to um, autonomously make 3D maps of construction sites or do infrastructure maintenance. And the incumbent firms can't do this by themselves. They partner with startups. So, uh, and in this case, the startup ecosystem isn't just an abstract concept because if we look at the history of production innovation and economic value creation, uh, the startup ecosystem in Silicon Valley grew firms that outcompeted Japan in 90s onwards, in particularly the high-end areas of Japanese strength up until then, semiconductors, consumer electronics, computers, and now with Tesla, cars. So uh, the question here is how well did the Abenomics third arrow reforms facilitate the growth and maturation of Japan's startup ecosystem? Uh, I was gonna outsource the explanation of Abenomics three arrows uh, to the introduction, but um, we were more focused on selling the book. So uh, the actual book has a nice overview, et cetera, in their introduction, but Takeo's introduction just now didn't have it. So briefly, right, the first arrow and second arrow, monetary policy, fiscal policy, the third arrow of Abe's reforms was uh, economic structural reform. And so that was the third arrow. There were lots of things in this third arrow. So how well did these reforms uh, assist, aid, in the growth of Japan's startup ecosystem. That's what I'm looking at in this chapter. Uh, the rise of the Silicon Valley model since the 90s, it's good to break down into the institutions. So finance is venture capital, industrial organization is large firm and startup symbiosis with open innovation with large firms harnessing the power of uh, and buying up startups. Employment in Silicon Valley, highly fluid, highly educated, a global draw. Government industry university organization is highly interactive and porous and uh, revolving door type arrangements. Startup ecosystem, a multitude of support players and social factors in Silicon Valley. Entrepreneurs are celebrated uh, and failures are monitored and evaluated. So you can fail well and you have 
uh, second and third chances, right? This contracts Japan's po traditional post-war model where all the institutions uh, are complementary. Uh, and this is where, of course, we draw upon Masa Aoki, uh, to whom the book is uh, dedicated. Finance, main bank system, industrial organization was vertical and horizontal industrial groups known as Keiretsu. Employment, long-term employment, seniority-based wages, government industry ties were uh, through dense interpersonal networks. Bureau pluralism, uh, competitive export industries versus politicized, domestic-oriented, non-competitive industries with a permissive international environment. So this is what Japan's startup ecosystem looked like. And then this is what it looks like now. The uh, post-war traditional model actively impeded the emergence of most of the institutions of Silicon Valley type uh, activity in Japan because they were pretty much the polar opposite. However, over the past 20 years, uh, Japan's startup ecosystem has matured considerably and a lot of these institutions have developed to the point that they have self-sustaining uh, feedback loops. For example, in finance, now we have small market, uh, small cap financial markets, a growing VC industry, and most importantly, the rise of independent VCs. Employment, we're seeing uh, increasing labor mobility in Japan, especially in the IT sector and with foreign firms. The large firms have lower prestige and less opportunities. Top funded startup founders tend to have elite backgrounds. Uh, so these people that were locked into large firms traditionally are now more and more willing to leave and start startups and then gather people as their workers for startups. Uh, universities are more able to spin out successful startups using technology and the government provides a lot of legitimacy for this industrial structure. A lot of big Japanese firms are more interested in open innovation, actively working with VC funds and startups, procuring from them. Uh, position of startups in society, the rising uh, attractiveness of entrepreneurship is real. Uh, if you can look at, if you look at uh, opinion surveys, it's more and more popular and the support ecosystem of law firms and accounting firms is maturing. So this is the big picture of Japan's maturing startup ecosystem. So in fact, we could even argue that Japan, there are multiple logics that are coexisting now. Lots of the ingredients of the traditional Japanese model are alive and well. The banks are there, a lot of industrial groups are there. In these traditional firms, long-term employment still exists, it's alive and well. But at the same time, in parallel to that, we have in the emerging startup ecosystem, venture capital financed fluid labor mobility, symbiotic, uh, uh, firms that are growing rapidly and working with large firms and a lot of the government industry uh, ties feed into that and there's a lot of legitimacy from the government which is you wouldn't have expected it to get this mature I didn't uh, 20 years ago when all we could see was a lot of impediments for this maturing and of course since each of these are uh, complementary within each of the logics it makes sense that it took some time. So within that context, this is where we look at the Abenomics third arrows, and we're just gonna do a broad brush here. So uh, the, the incredible thing about these uh, third arrow reform uh, strategies was that there were specific key performance indicators, KPIs, Every year, there were uh, quite significantly large documents of uh, specific KPIs. And here's the number. And the first uh, revitalization strategy uh, with the enticing title, Japan is back. Uh, nobody had done that kind of economic strategy branding before. Uh, and it was part of the Abenomics. 100 KPIs, those grew. Uh, some were removed, some new ones were added. But every year, so we ended up with, at the end of, now that we can see the uh, end of the Abe administration, uh, 144 KPIs. So what did they look like? And they went there, several categories, uh, and the categories changed every year depending on the focus. But here are some examples. For example, in finance, uh, related to the startup ecosystem. One was to double the proportion of venture capital investments into startups as a proportion of nominal GDP. This was added in 2016, and you can follow uh, what, how it uh, progressed and was it on track or not. Uh, this is our analysis. Was it on track? Well, if you extrapolate linearly and not on track for this one, aim for 20 Japanese unicorn companies, private or public. And here it is on track. Uh, although the way they count unicorns is a little bit different. A uh, unicorn here is uh, a, a pre-IPO company valued at a billion dollars or more. Uh, and in this uh, way of counting, their way of counting unicorns, uh, recently IPO'd companies also count. So it's a slightly different measure. But 
uh, and that in itself is indicating uh, a little bit indicative a little bit about the nature of these KPIs. For example, other things like university industry coordination, you know, increasing the number of patents granted to universities, tripling the investments from corporations into universities, uh, doubling the number of large scale joint research projects between corporations and universities. And a lot of these were either achieved or on track. And there's a long list of this type of thing. Some others include create consortia of industry, academia, government, financial sector collaboration to provide support to 200 pioneering technological development projects using locally developed technologies every year. And uh, yeah, quite a few were developed. Increase the ratio of R&D investment, including both public and private sectors to 4% of GDP. Almost, may, not quite unless a big jump happened. So, uh, but again, these goals, are the type of thing that you can see through if you go through uh, the 140 or so in here. Uh, some pretty interesting ones are in there too. Some strategic policies, including over 80 banks adopt open APIs, application protocol interfaces, basically allowing uh, third parties to access uh, bank accounts with some control uh, mechanisms as a commodity. Uh, which was great for a lot of regional banks that were trying to tie into new services. And the banks here uh, then are able to link up with new fintech startups to, uh, by opening up their APIs to provide services via linking them to these new startups. Uh, and this kind of thing was achieved. Doubling the amount of cashless electronic payments uh, to 40% by 2027. Yes, it's on track. Uh, thanks to COVID, even more on track, uh, things like this. So uh, the bottom line, uh, and I urge you, I have a, a very long uh, appendix in the book chapter and several pieces uh, here and there spread throughout each of the institutions uh, of the specific KPIs. Many of these KPIs would likely have been achievable anyway, even if you did nothing. However, legitimization of a lot of these factors underpinning the startup ecosystem, this can be quite important because 20 years ago, 15 years ago, even uh, 10 years ago, the startup ecosystem in Japan was not as significant a legitimate force in the economy as it is seen today. And the government lending to some of the goals, lending itself to some of these goals uh, really did help with social legitimization. And there are many interesting stories around this shift. Now, some of the strategic policies can provide corporate management with political cover to collaborate with startups and try new things. Conservatism among large corporations has been seen as a significant driver of uh, lack of flexibility. And it's because risk averse managers will try something new and work with startups. What if the startup doesn't work out, et cetera, et cetera. But with this much legitimization and even KPIs of trying to uh, uh, have an increased number of government, university, industry collaborations, et cetera. Well, this can actually really reduce the pressure on some corporate management decisions to then work with startups, which can then get the whole ecosystem going better. So having these KPIs is far better than not having them. And mo most importantly, they're not counterproductive. Uh, after previous books that let's say uh, uh, Philip and I edited on the DPJ uh, where policymaking was Implementation was a little bit chaotic. Uh, the strategy was, it shifted this way and that way. Uh, and the LDP did that before they fell, before the DPJ. So the fact that they're not counterproductive or fundamentally detrimental to the maturing startup ecosystem, well, this is not something to be taken for granted. So uh, that's it for me and thank you. Back to Takeo or, or to Patty, Patty and Kate. All right. Um, thank you, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I want to thank Takeo and Philip to start off for inviting me to participate in this project. It's been a real pleasure. And also to Karen, Kiyo, uh, Kiyo and the staff at APARC. Thanks for putting this session together. This is fun. Um, I'm going to divide my remarks. Uh, we're going to divide our remarks into two. I'm going to talk a little bit about Abe's accomplishments on the agricultural reform front. And then Kay will say a few things about recent trends in farming and agricultural reform under Prime Minister Suga and particularly in the context of COVID. So if ever a sector symbolized the long-term struggle be in Japan between the economic reformist impulse and what Prime Minister Koizumi used to call the political forces of resistance, it would have to be agriculture. On the one hand, agriculture faces an enormous multifaceted crisis. 
farming is desperately in need of structural reform. And by that, we mean very simply reforms that will make farming more productive and more profitable. For example, economically, the domestic demand for food has been rapidly declining, particularly for rice. The average farm size still remains too small and agricultural production costs far too high and farm household in, uh, incomes are shrinking. Um, and that's in marked contrast to 20, 30 years ago when they used to exceed comparable worker incomes. Demographically, Japan's shrinking farm population is aging at one of the fastest rates in the world. Today, the average age of the typical farmer is about 68 years old. More problematically for farmers themselves, as many as 50% or more of farm households lack successors to take over the family farm. So these and related prog uh, problems are all interconnected. There are few young people moving into farming, taking over the family business, for example, largely because they know that they can make a better living elsewhere off the farm. Now, on the other hand, while these and other serious problems are clear to all who pay attention to Japanese agriculture, introducing reforms over the decades has been notoriously difficult for Japan. And this is largely because of pressures from Japan's at one time very powerful conservative farm lobby that consisted of anti-reform voices within the Ministry of Agriculture, the LDP's rural representatives, and of course, JA, or Nokyo, as it used to be called, um, which is a national three-tiered network of Japanese agricultural cooperatives and related service providers. Now, in the past, um, this farm lobby made the reform of the many farm policies and uh, the, the very political alliance that backed them up politically taboo. And as a result of their pressure, the lobby has ensured that past reforms would remain small in scale and very much at the margins of what needed to be done. So with this in mind, we think it was a very big deal when Abe came to power and almost immediately he elevated agricultural reform as a signature policy of structural reform, that so-called third arrow component of Abenomics. And Abe's goals were extremely ambitious. He wanted nothing less than to transform Japanese agriculture into a growth industry and to double farm incomes within 10 years. And in so doing, he set out to tackle the many taboo farm policies that had made it so inefficient to farm and also the political alliances which buttressed that farm policy regime. So let's fast forward a bit to the present and with the benefit of hindsight, we can ask, what exactly did Abe achieve on the agricultural uh, front? To what extent was he successful? And our answer in the chapter is that the record is very mixed. For every accomplishment, there's a big but. For example, Abe managed to diversify farm enterprises beyond what had been accomplished before. But as Kay will touch on later, many family farms continues to struggle today. He also managed to increase the rate of farm consolidation to make farms bigger, which is necessary for more productive agriculture, but his accomplishments fell far short of government targets. Farm exports have also been actively promoted as an antidote to declining domestic demand for rice and for food, but here too, the record has proven somewhat disappointing with some progress, but not as much as many had hoped. There's also been a further liberalization of the rice market under Abe. The most important one, of course, occurred in the mid-1990s when the market was open to farm uh, rice imports for the first time in post-war history and uh, pricing became more liberalized. But no sooner did Abe introduce changes to some of those uh, market-defying policies when he turned around and introduced new subsidies that really don't do much to improve the um, efficiency of rice farming. And then finally, and of great interest to us, Kay and I are actually writing a book on this. Um, for the first time in decades, the Abe administration managed to tackle the most politically taboo issue of all in the Japanese farm sector, and that's the reform of JA, or Japan Agricultural Cooperatives. Um, and, and to a degree, he accomplished more than any of his predecessors, 
As a result of the reforms, Japanese local co-ops now have more freedom. They're no longer um, as beholden to the stifling embrace of Japan or JA's national leadership. But compared to the ambitious goals that the Abe administration first set out for itself several years ago, the accomplishments on this front as well are relatively modest. So I guess you could say we don't sound very bullish about all of this, but in point of fact, and in the chapter, we actually assess this rather optimistically as a glass half full. And that's because we recognize that Abe did more than any other prime minister in recent memory to make agriculture more productive and, pro and profitable. So the question that then arises is what explains this relative success? And we see two sets of, of explanations here. And the first is the legacy of those small scale agricultural reforms of the past, which enabled Abe's successes. For example, Abe helped many corporations from the retail, manufacturing and construction industries, for example, to enter into agricultural production. And this would have been next to impossible had farmland leasing not been liberalized in 2009, several years before Abe returned to power. We also privilege political explanations. Unlike his predecessors, for instance, Abe managed to centralize the agricultural policymaking process in the Conte, where business neoliberal voices held sway and the reformist impulse was strongest. And this in turn marginalized the lobby's influence, thereby making it possible to even table a bill on JA reform, for instance. This also would have been very, very uh, difficult to achieve had that conservative farm lobby not already been weakened by the political electoral reforms of the 1990s, which diminished JA's electoral and lobbying clout. We don't wanna suggest, however, that the lobby has disappeared. We've noticed, and we write about in the chapter, that by mid to late 2017, it was clear from both a decline in the government's agricultural reform initiatives and the appointments in that year to the LDP's all powerful or all important farm Zoku that the government was ceding some ground to that lobby. And that lobby is likely to remain a thorn in the side of Prime Minister Suga. So let me just ask one more question, which is Abe may have done more than his predecessors on the agricultural front, but many critics point out and rightly so that he may have done a lot more than he did. So why didn't he? Well, we've already got one answer to that. The farm lobby is still doing all it can to slow the pace of at least some of these reforms. But I think some of the other answers have to do with Abe himself. For starters, Abe was distracted. Unlike his former mentor, Koizumi, Abe did not stake his political career on a single issue. He had other fish, fish to fry and was prepared to sacrifice um, a more proactive agricultural reform agenda in the latter year of his uh, tenure in order to pay more attention to those other issues. And finally, unlike his successor, Tsuga, Abe wasn't exactly an expert on things agricultural. And I think that's my segue to Kay. So thank you very much. Thanks, Patty. And thank you everyone, especially our organizers and hosts today. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm just gonna spend a few minutes talking about sort of looking into the future or what agriculture policy looks like under our current Prime Minister Suga. So as Patty just mentioned at the end of her presentation, Prime Minister Suga, unlike his predecessors and like unlike many recent prime ministers, has roots in rural Japan, to Akita Prefecture in Northern Japan to be precise, and is himself the son of a farmer which is a rarity among recent prime ministers who tend to be well-connected, often second generation uh, politicians from a political family. And as such, there was and is much hope, especially among those lobbyists, the farm lobby that Patty just mentioned, that he will have much more concern for the quote unquote traditional farmer. And that connects directly to my next point about a backlash from Abe's efforts towards reforming uh, agriculture to be more market oriented. As many of you know, Prime Minister Suga ran as for prime minister on a platform of stability and more of Abenomics, that is continuity from the Abe administration. And during the Abe administration, much of agricultural policy came via the various committees 
with heavy input from the private sector, resulting in more market-oriented reforms, as Patty just mentioned. For example, allowing greater corporate entry into agriculture via land usage, land ownership, and incorpor incorporation. But while even the JA recognizes the need to diversify agriculture away from the traditional farmers whose numbers are declining, these new entrants have done little to help the plight of agriculture in most of rural Japan. Those small time family farmers have not really seen the benefits of these corporate entrants. Thus, JA and non-corporate farmers hope that Prime Minister Suga will not be just more of the same, a continuation of the Abe administration, but that he will recognize the characteristics of the JA co-op system to revitalize both agriculture and rural communities, which is, are two very important uh, pieces on Suga's agenda. Um, thirdly, uh, Suga's policies thus far. Uh, as you all know, agriculture has not been front and center on the Suga agenda for very obvious reasons. The COVID pandemic was already ongoing when Suga came into power. But a key area of support has been, in, has been for increased agricultural exports. As Suga has been very gung-ho about increasing agricultural exports from the very beginning. So to that end, tra trade deals such as the UK's application to join the TPP have been welcomed uh, to a certain extent. And lastly, let me make a comment on the effect of COVID and the current pandemic. Unlike the US where farmers have had to till their harvest back into the land due to backlogs in the distribution system during the pandemic and long lines forming in food banks, Japanese farmers have done relatively well during COVID. Perhaps this is not really a fair comparison because the pandemic in Japan has been much more benign than it has been in parts of Western Europe or especially the United States. Uh, but nevertheless, those farmers who supply the very high end uh, produce, uh, that which is Japan's agriculture is very famous for very expensive produce for the very high end consumers have suffered due to a downturn in the restaurant and hotel industries as well as um, the travel industry. But this has also led to a bigger push to encourage farmers and JA to strengthen their marketing skills especially vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the internet and e-commerce. Um, and one last point on COVID, uh, the pandemic has also accelerated the technological investment in agriculture, including mechanization, automation, and digitization. And this is a large part due to the sudden decrease in foreign workers on farms. Japan's agriculture currently relies heavily on foreign guest workers. Uh, many of them who are considered quote unquote trainees and are here for several years. Um, and technological solutions as a result of these foreign workers have kind of taken a back burner until now. But the worker shortage problem, which has been made fairly much more acute by the pandemic has made uh, investment in technological uh, gains in agriculture uh, much higher in this past year. And there's a reason for hope in that area. So I'd like to conclude there uh, and pass the baton on to, I guess, Trevor. Thank you, Kay. Um, and thank you also to uh, the organizers. Uh, okay, so I will be today presenting uh, co-authored work with Philip Lipsy, Associate Professor at the University of Toronto on the politics of energy and climate change under the Abe government. Um, and Philip and I like to start actually by looking at Trump's energy policy, which some people might be familiar with. Uh, we recognize policies like cutting government support for renewable energy like solar and wind, weakening environmental regulations, accelerated construction of coal-powered fire plants, coal-fired power plants, sorry, reversing international climate change commitments of their predecessors. Um, the punchline is that this is actually Abe's energy policy, where you can basically replace uh, democratic policies with those of the DPJ. So why is this? Some of the research puzzles are that despite Fukushima nuclear disaster and global climate change concerns, Abe's energy policy emphasizes nuclear and coal. It weakens support for renewable energy, avoids meaningful CO2 mitigation measures, 
Why has the LDP adopted this pro-nuclear stance when it's extremely unpopular amongst the general public and nonetheless managed to win elections? And why has Japan gone from a leader in global climate change negotiations to being called a fossil and a villain by its peers? So our argument is a, a new word, abenogenomics, which you can try to say three times fast, uh, which we define as a set of energy policies designed to support the economic growth objectives of abenomics with relatively less regard for pop popular opinion, opposition from utility companies or environmental consequences. And so some of the specific characteristics of these energy policies are the promotion of low electricity prices to stimulate economic growth, to support green technology only where it benefits Japanese firms and industrial policy, a willingness to override public opposition or the interest of large players like utilities, um, and a prioritization of the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry at the expense of the Ministry of Environment. So for some context, uh, Japanese energy conservation and climate change policy is typically constrained by various factors. And many of these are not unique to Japan. So electoral incentives necessitate a broad appeal to the median voter, uh, which gives pressure to lower energy costs, but also in the case of Japan advocates for environmentalism where environmentalism is a popular policy amongst the public. Um, there's concerns about economic competitiveness. Japan's large public debt and slow economic growth make investment in expensive things like renewable technology and compensation of losers difficult. Um, and there's of course international treaty obligations. So we argue that some of these constraints are temporarily less binding under Abe. Um, the collapse of the opposition parties um, post DPJ relieves electoral pressure and gives more leeway. The Fukushima disaster created a pretext for some major reforms on energy policy, although maybe not in the way we expected. Um, and Abe does have relatively stable macroeconomic conditions throughout his tenure. So Abe used this window of opportunity and these temporary easing of constraints to shift Japanese energy policy away from climate change mitigation and towards economic growth. We could easily see how this could have been an opportunity to invest heavily in renewable energy, but that's not what we actually see. So for some examples, um, Abe's energy policy can be defined by a commitment to nuclear power despite the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Um, under Abe, Japan became the only G7 country promoting coal-fired power plants, both domestically and uh, abroad. Abe engaged in a, pro a policy of electricity deregulation, which was opposed by utility companies, but leads to lower energy prices for consumers. There is a commitment to hydrogen vehicles, um, a policy program known as Hydrogen Society, despite a real consensus that this is economically viable or competitive on the market. Um, and Abe also reformed the feed-in tariff to make it more difficult to qualify, uh, which reduces investment in uh, renewable energy, such as solar and wind capacity, but should in theory lower prices as well. So this is what Japan's energy mix looks like pre and post Fukushima. So you can easily see the complete collapse of nuclear energy post Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster. What you might expect to see here is a growth in renewables to compensate for the lack of nuclear energy. Um, and what you actually see is an increase in fossil fuels, uh, particularly natural gas. You can see a large uptick in, and actually recently um, Japan just had a bit of an energy supply shock um, when LNG resources became undersupplied uh, during a cold snap in the north. So here's another metric um, which shows Japan's previous competitiveness in these arenas, uh, which is CO2 emissions intensity. So effectively, how much energy is used in an output of economic production. And you can see that Japan used to be a global leader by this metric, um, but more recently has been surpassed by G7 Europe, for example. And you can see that since you know, around uh, late 90s, 2000s, Japan has been pretty much stagnant on this metric. So getting into some more specifics like uh, post Fukushima nuclear policy reforms, um, many of these were actually under the DPJ, um, but there was overwhelming negative public opinion of nuclear power post Fukushima. Um, so the DPJ removed the Nuclear Industrial Safety Agency from METI, abolished it, and replaced it with the Nuclear Regulatory Authority, which was within the Ministry of Environment. Um, the LDP opposed this. 
uh, more stringent rules for amakudari or bureaucratic retirement um, into the private sector were reinstated, um, although this does certainly still happen. Uh, there is the establishment of an independent energy and environment council to form national energy policy, um, again, kind of taking power away from METI. So Abe's nuclear goals in particular were to restart nuclear plants to provide stable, cheap energy in the short term. Uh, and this plan specifically is 20 to 22% nuclear by 2030. And I'll talk about why this is very, very unlikely to happen. Uh, that policy is supported by K Dunman and utilities. Um, and Abe also encouraged nuclear exports to boost, uh, just to boost exports and reduce the deficit. He also wanted to return national energy policy decision-making into METI uh, and away from the Ministry of Environment. And many of the LDP's appointments into the new nuclear regulatory authority were seen uh, as pro-nuclear by observers. So these policies were opposed by virtually all opposition parties, but as we know, these opposition parties are scattered and not consolidated, which has made any sort of national pushback on these policies quite difficult. So what's the reality of these nuclear policies that Abe set out to achieve? Um, the reality is that currently nuclear is only 6% of the current energy supply, not only 20, and it's unlikely to become over 20 by 2030. Uh, this has largely actually been because local and prefectural governments and court opposition. Um, so over 30 lawsuits have been filed between 2011 and 2030, representing 85% of all nuclear reactor restarts requests have been opposed by these uh, local lawsuits. So in 2020, the number of plants online actually decreased uh, to six from nine in 2018, which is a high. And there was actually a brief period of time last year where only one reactor was online um, because of a failure to meet certain regulatory requirements on time and these lawsuits. So the Nuclear Regulatory Authority has shut down nuclear plants over safety concerns and required serious safety reinvestments to reopen um, safety requirements and for investments in uh, terrorism protection, which is what shut some plants last year. Uh, the DPJ effort to increase the independence of the NRA therefore appears to have survived its assault from the LDP largely. Uh, Abe has asked for all reactors, or at the beginning of his time in office, he asked for all reactors to be restarted within three years. The NRA resisted this quite strongly and stuck with their guns on their uh, regulations that they had imposed. So in conclusion, Japan was already a laggard on climate change in terms of energy policy, um, and Abe took this further. So Abe Energynomics prioritized low energy prices for economic growth at the expense of potential other considerations. Abe used his leeway to push unpopular policies that nonetheless lowered electricity costs. So for example, nuclear restarts and promotion of coal-fired power plants. This explains some of the seemingly contradictory policies. Um, for example, deregulation of electricity distribution hurts powerful utilities, but it lowers electricity prices. The rollback of the feed-in tariff helps utilities and lowers electricity prices. Abe's emphasis on coal is environmentally unfriendly, but again, lowers electricity prices. Um, and this emphasis on hydrogen society, um, which you can still see today, the Olympic torch is supposed to be powered with hydrogen and a fleet of hydrogen buses is supposed to shuttle people around the Olympics. Um, again, this is an environmentally friendly policy, might not be that economically viable, but Japanese firms are strong in this domain and it supports them. And um, so that's where I will leave it um, and turn it over to Philip. Thank you, Trevor. That was great. Um, so what I would like to do is to close uh, the presentation part of this session by uh, briefly talking about the implications for the Suga Prime Ministership uh, of our work. But before I do that, I'd like to, uh, of course, thank Keo and Janet. It's uh, great to be back, quote unquote, uh, to A Park. And I've been looking at the uh, participants list and it's, it's so wonderful to see so many familiar faces. Uh, so hopefully we can do this uh, in person uh, in the near future. Um, so I guess the, the question is uh, what now, right? The book, the volume that we made uh, was about the Abe government and Abenomics, uh, but of course now we have a new prime minister uh, after Abe resigned in September 2020, citing uh, health concerns, but also seeing his popularity diminish considerably during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic response. Um, and he was succeeded by Suga, who was his chief cabinet secretary. Um, and 
you know, it, it's somewhat difficult to judge where the Suga government is going because so much of the early months of the Suga government have been dominated by COVID-19 response. But I think we can draw some tentative conclusions. So there's one question, which is, uh, is there more continuity or discontinuity between the Abe and Suga governments? Um, and because Suga was such a key person in the Abe government, uh, particularly on the domestic front, I think it's fair to say we've seen a considerable degree of continuity. That said, Suga has attempted to differentiate himself from the Abe government uh, by promoting some new reforms. Uh, and going to Trevor's presentation, uh, the pledge to reduce carbon emissions to net zero by 2050 uh, was uh, a serious uh, big policy announcement uh, and very well received internationally. I think the implementation will be the big question mark there. He's also promoted digitization um, and the cutting of mobile carrier fees, which is uh, a longstanding policy uh, interest of his. Um, from what I've heard from uh, my uh, colleagues and friends in Japan is that perhaps Suga is expressing so far less personal interest in foreign policy compared to Abe, uh, and therefore on foreign policy, it appears that the bureaucracy might be uh, taking over greater authority than during the Abe years. So perhaps that might be something interesting to watch. One thing that um, we talk about in the edited volume is this idea that the Abe government came into power with a governance model that they uh, tried to develop based on their lessons of the first Abe prime ministership, as well as other uh, short-lived uh, governments in Japan's past. And uh, the model tried to take advantage of Japan's new political institutions. And several key characteristics of this new model uh, were proactive management of the prime minister's public approval rating using things like uh, the Abenomics reforms, which was used uh, very much intentionally as a way to boost the prime minister's popularity. They tried to pivot back to Abenomics themes when the prime minister's popularity took a hit because of controversial securities legislation, for example. Uh, there was a very uh, clear media strategy uh, that has been uh, widely criticized, but also very intentionally used to try to uh, control the prime minister's public image. And there has been an appeal to conservatives uh, that grew out of, of course, Abe's longstanding credentials as a Japanese conservative. Abe also pursued party discipline by calling snap elections twice, uh, which gave him some credibility vis-a-vis -vis party bank ventures. And he's uh, deepened centralization of administrative authority the previous uh, prime ministers in Japan had already developed. Uh, Abe took this further. Um, one thing that we saw, though, at the tail end of the Abe government was that this model was not uh, functioning very effectively once COVID-19 hit. And in the introduction, we uh, argue that this might be because uh, the model was well suited in some sense to peacetime, but perhaps less so to pandemic conditions. Uh, for example, uh, the pandemic introduced this trade-off between economic growth and uh, dealing with the virus. And for Abe to shut down the economy would have been a way to throw away much of the econo macroeconomic progress that had been made under Abenomics. And this arguably made the government somewhat hesitant to pursue extreme measures. Um, there was also an attempt to use the same strategy they had used before as the prime minister's popularity declined they attempted to pivot back to macroeconomic growth themes, particularly with the go-to travel scheme, which subsidized travel to uh, mostly rural areas in Japan. But of course, under within the context of a pandemic, this ended up spreading the virus uh, instead of stimulating the economy. So what worked before uh, suddenly ran into quite a bit of trouble. And as Abe's popularity began to decline, he began to face more resistance from within his party. Um, I think there were some limits uh, of the media strategy that were exposed. I won't go into that in great detail here. Um, but it also, I think the pandemic uh, uh, demonstrated some limits to centralization of authority in Japan, which is very much true at the central level. 
uh, but does not extend to local governments. And it turns out for uh, testing and other aspects of pandemic response, the role of local governments uh, loomed quite large and there Abe did not uh, have great authority uh, of the kind that he had at the central government level. Um, and so I think the early months of the Suga government have to a significant degree shown a very similar pattern to the late months of the Abe government. Um, and Suga started out with relatively high public approval ratings, but his public approval ratings have declined mostly if you look at polls uh, due to perceptions that he's not handling the COVID-19 response effectively. Um, and if you compare uh, at the fifth or sixth month in office, Suga's approval rating to previous prime ministers, he's very much following the same trend that uh, one year prime ministers followed, right? Uh, Koizumi and the second Abe government had a net approval rating of about 40, 60%. Um, and all the other prime ministers that lasted about a year had fallen quite quickly to about zero or negative territory. And that's roughly where Suga is. So based on the public approval numbers, Suga's current position doesn't look very good. And the problem under today's Japanese government institutions is if you don't have that strong public approval, uh, you don't have much leverage against people in your own party and that undercuts your authority and you can end up in a bit of a death spiral. And so I think Suga is very much uh, in, in, a, in a very tough spot uh, at the moment. So just to conclude, I would say that both Abe and Suga seem to have struggled to adapt uh, what was seemingly a successful model of governance to this key issue of the day, which was COVID-19 response. Um, and the entire reform agenda of the Suga government will be quite challenging if uh, he cannot maintain a relatively high level of public backing, which uh, is, is currently beginning to erode. Uh, of course, the LDP has to call a lower house election before October 2021. And it should be noted that the LDP is still in a very strong position uh, for an election because the opposition remains quite unpopular and weak. But I think the LDP will face the question of, do they want to run an election with Suga as their face or do they want to replace him with somebody else? So I will leave it at that and I look forward to your questions. Great, at this point, I'd like to um, invite all the presenters to come into the frame by uh, unmuting your video. I wanna pose one question, uh, question to uh, get the discussion started. Um, they have, um, so abenomics in those areas, mixed results, grass half full, um, but you know, we live in a world where mixed results are actually pretty good in politics, uh, so that's not too bad. Um, but going forward, and there were a lot, a lot of mentions of uh, continuity uh, in the Suga government, um, I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit more uh, about um, uh, what you see in the future, what you would like to see in the future. So if you could say a few words about uh, one or two policy initiatives that you'd like to see in the area that you focus in, um, the policy initiatives by the Suga government going forward. Uh, you know, Suga, uh, Prime, Minister, Prime Minister Suga is clearly um, you know, very focused on innovation, for instance, the digital economy, digitalization is very um, at the core of uh, uh, Suga government's agenda. Climate change, he made a major pronouncement about going uh, carbon free. Um, and as Patty or as uh, Kay mentioned, uh, agriculture is very close to, to his heart coming from a farming background in Akita. So if you could say a few words about um, some of the uh, major policy initiatives, or could be minor, the policy in initiative that you would particularly like to see from the Suga government in the coming uh, months and years, uh, starting with Whoever, you know, anybody can start, maybe Takeo or Kenji. Oh, okay, I, I, I guess uh, let, let me start. Uh, there, there are several areas of uh, Suga government that I would pay attention. You, you know, Kiyo talked about the digital uh, digitalization policy. So far it's limited, I think, mostly limited to the digitalization of the government at the center of government and the local government. And Suga doesn't seem to be ambitious enough to talk about the digitalization of the economy as a whole and more, more digitalization in uh, business. Uh, there is actually a question, a Q&A uh, in talking 
about the trace, the introducing some traceability in agricultural products. Uh, I don't think uh, that that is a key issue in digitalization policy in Suga. So uh, I, I think the digitalization is the right way to go, but, but it's so far the policy seems to be limited to the narrow area. Uh, in the environmental policy, um, the Suga has been talking about a little bit about the, uh, the, the no, no carbon by 2050. Uh, so far, the policy seems to depend too much on innovation, which hasn't happened yet. And uh, I, I think the, the government eventually will need uh, some more economic policy or e economic uh, intervention to change the people's behavior on energy use, that type of thing, or introducing price to the carbon. So that I don't see. And uh, one more thing that we don't talk about a chapter on corporate governance reform today, but the one important message from the chapter done by Hideaki Miyajima is that the corporate governance reform led to some changes in appearance of the corporation, but it hasn't led to the change in the behavior of corporations, which uh, corporate governance reform expected to be more responsive to the shareholders' interest and so on. So that type of reform uh, is, I ideally uh, should continue. So then let, let me stop here and uh, give other people a chance to respond. Sure, I'll jump in next. Um, so there's a startup ecosystem part and then a KPI's growth strategy part of what I'd like to say. Uh, for the startup ecosystem, it's pretty simple. Uh, my view is that anything that increases the legitimacy or maintains the legitimacy of the startup ecosystem as the various parts create positive feedback loops to mature, this is a good thing. For the KPIs, uh, so the last couple were called uh, strategic growth plan and um, the uh, Suda administration did hold a strategic growth plan meeting where it outlined some of these. The uh, third arrow reforms, the uh, strategic growth plan, the KPIs, they largely came from bottom up uh, processes where the ministries, various ministries submitted uh, KPIs to go up. And interestingly, um, I, th well, I found it interesting that the Abe administration didn't really, perhaps because they didn't need to, but they didn't take that much credit for them saying, look at all of these KPIs, we met this, we met that one and use it to try to bolster public opinion. Uh, but it really didn't need to. Uh, maybe the time has passed to make use of them. But if the Suga administration does need to bolster it, it could go ahead and say, do some bragging about the things it had met. But of course, that opens it up to uh, critiques against things that it hasn't met. Uh, so, but this uh, issue of getting um, bottom up targets that are specific KPIs that are numeric, uh, I think are good. And you can imagine how the two of things, startup ecosystem and this would be, uh, KPIs would be linked, like the digitalization agency that's uh, coming up. They're getting some people from the private sector on the first day reporting for work. My friend tells me they were told in their instructions to bring their stamp, their hunkle, right? The first day for uh, to the ministry that's trying to get rid of that, the agency that's trying to get rid of that. So there are a bunch of startups that are offering things like uh, digital authentication in various ways that do some things that DocuSign can't. Well, having KPIs saying that uh, X number of percentage of transactions should be done this way. And if there are uh, incumbent firms and startups that can offer this kind of thing, uh, that's great. Others like, um, yeah, well, uh, so a, a variety of uh, activities that can be done, not just by incumbent firms, but labor saving uh, robotics or AI. And the government can play a great role, I think, in legitimizing and accelerating that. And that's what I'd like to see them do. Um, let me jump in a bit for um, the agricultural side and especially the rural economy. I think for Prime Minister Suga, there are several indications that he's quite concerned about revitalizing uh, the rural economy, especially after, during and after this pandemic. Um, and of course, agriculture is one of them, but closely related to that is uh, something that Philip mentioned, the go-to travel program, which mostly benefited rural areas that had really seen a stop in traffic, especially from travelers, uh, foreign travelers in particular, but also domestic travelers. Yes, Prime Minister Suga has also um, sort of uh, conveniently pushed the reform of regional banks uh, that serve local rural um, areas primarily. 
Um, and these are areas that in the past have, you know, people have known just like agriculture that there have long been uh, problems of um, <clears throat> competitiveness and, and marketization. And yet few prime ministers have done anything about them. Uh, and Prime Minister Suga is one of the first to really sort of poke uh, a needle into these things and try to get some type of competitiveness and um, and marketization into these areas. And so for a rural revitalization, which of course is intricately linked to the demographic decline in rural areas, um, these kinds of economic reforms are vital for uh, supporting and changing the way uh, rural economies work. And so it, coupled with digital, digitization, uh, which in part has to do with linking local economies and local governments to the central government in a much more efficient manner, especially in light of this uh, current uh, uh, ongoing effort to try to get people vaccinated under COVID, for example. Um, these types of things that would push uh, local economies to be more intricately linked to uh, central level economies and central level government, I think will um, be a long term project, but a certain boost to Japan's economy. I'll add, I'll add just a little bit on uh, climate change. Uh, so I agree completely with Takeo, right? Uh, with climate change response, the Suga government's announcement is very much welcome. Uh, and, and it's exactly where Japan should be. But the key is that this is a marathon, right? A 2050 target is an easy thing for a politician to put out because the politician is not gonna be in power in 2050. Uh, so the key is policies now, institutionalization, so that progress will be made consistently and will not be reversed the next time the prime minister changes and somebody who's less enthusiastic and more interested in cutting energy prices comes into power. You need that continuity to really achieve the kind of objectives that the Suga government has in mind. Very briefly, I, I agree with um, both Takeo and Philip said that uh, the recent Suga government announcement is very large on promise. It's very light on details. So um, what this will actually mean in practice, I would personally like to see just a acknowledgement that nuclear will not make up 20 to 22 percent of uh, energy by 2050 and to see how that uh, gap will be replaced. Will it be replaced with solar? Will it be replaced with wind? Will a DPJ style feed-in tariff be put back into place with uh, higher incentives for small energy producers to get into the market and, uh, and produce this kind of energy? I would just like to underscore Kay's remarks about the um, importance of rural revitalization and just say how unfortunate it is that it's been connected primarily to tourism, particularly under COVID. But um, as we discovered when we were doing our field work, um, you don't often hear about it in the cities, but you hear a lot about rural revitalization and the reality of it is dying villages, dying towns, elderly populations that are uncovered by basic services. This is a huge demographic and economic problem with environmental and a host of other implications. Um, so it's something that if Suga doesn't look at, the next prime minister will have to because it's electorally significant as well as economically and socially. Great. I will go very quickly. Uh, there are a lot of questions. Thank you, audience. and. Um... It, there's a nice distribution, so I'll um, specifically point to um, um, each speaker. Uh, for Kenji, for Michael Wielendiger, a very broad question. Uh, so sure, there have been some changes under Abe, but given Japan's declining competitiveness, did he do enough? Yeah. And then, uh, then um, to Patty and Kay, uh, there's an interesting question, a uh, series of questions from Kevin Newman. Uh, particularly interesting is the question about uh, producing hemp. Uh, there, are, there are a series of hurdles in Japan uh, for that to happen, but may, this is an interesting kind of idea uh, in testing how much uh, um, innovative policy making that Suga administration could actually accomplish. Uh, is it possible to uh, for, for the Japanese farmer to start making hemp? And uh, you can maybe illustrate the kinds of hurdles that exist uh, legally and, and economically and, and all sorts of uh, limitations. Um, and, and, there's already some comments about the uh, blockchain thing. So let's, let's, let me skip that uh, in, in the interest of time. Uh, for um, Philip and, and uh, Trevor, a couple of questions. Uh, one from David Fiedler. Uh, besides reducing carbon emissions, what are some of Abe's policies uh, of environmental sustainability that Suga will carry? And then from Anthony Hamet, uh, 
Uh, the current Australian government, Australian government hopes to use massive exports to Japan of green hydrogen to solve its uh, problems in terms of poor environmental record and losing trade war with China. Are, are such massive hydrogen exports feasible in the current policy settings? Uh, so uh, please quickly, um, all of you starting with Kenji perhaps. Great, yeah, did Abe do enough? Um, so that depends on how, where you set the bar. I set the bar really, really low. So uh, yes, he could have done a lot more, uh, but could he have done a lot worse? Well, we've seen in this country, uh, lots of things can move in different directions quite quickly and then need to be reversed. He could have done much worse. Did he do enough? Uh, in my low bar, yes, but I, he could have done much more. Um, let me address the issue of uh, you know alternative produce. Um, and uh, as Kyo just mentioned, there are of course many hurdles to introducing hemp to the agricultural sort of uh, array of possibilities in Japan. And I just, you know, I don't know specifically about to the popularity of that or whether or not there's enough interest in making that kind of transition. But let me just say that uh, at the very basic level, it's very difficult for uh, us, uh, for the government to even convince uh, farmers to get out of rice farming into soybeans, let alone to go into other areas uh, that are you know, completely foreign to the Japanese agricultural workforce. So um, the, the hurdles are high. It's not that it's not possible, uh, but the chances in my prediction are very, very low. Um, okay, um, so I, I think uh, definitely on, on the energy issues, uh, I think there is quite a bit of continuity, as, as Trevor pointed out, on nuclear policy, uh, being pro-nuclear, uh, as well as uh, on hydrogen, which is Anthony's question. Um, so I, I'm, I'm personally skeptical about hydrogen as a way to manage climate change, uh, particularly in Japan, where it has to be, uh, as, as you point out, shipped from Australia, uh, burning fossil fuels all the way along uh, before it gets into uh, a vehicle in Japan. Uh, but politically, I think the support for hydrogen in Japan is fairly robust. And so I think at least in the near term, uh, you know, this is something that will probably proceed in the long term, whether it's actually solving a policy problem, I'm somewhat more skeptical. Yeah, on the question of hydrogen, I, I completely agree with Philip. Um, and I think if you were to ask anyone in the automotive industry, for example, whether hydrogen fuel cell vehicles are the future of the automotive industry, they, they will tell you no. Um, the, so the question is, is there a market for this hydrogen, um, both domestically in Japan and, uh, and around the world? And we've seen the price of the lithium batteries that go into a vehicle like uh, what Tesla or Volkswagen or so on are producing drop dramatically over the past decade. We've not seen the same thing with hydrogen fuel cells that make them an economically viable uh, product for, for every day. Um, so I personally share a lot of the skepticism on hydrogen as, as a major player. All right. Uh, I apologize for going over time, uh, but these are all very terrific presentations. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you, Janet, for uh, putting together this event. And um, as Takeo announced at the beginning, there will be more uh, book launch events related to uh, this book, uh, focusing on other chapters uh, of the book. And this is a terrific book that anybody who's interested in Japanese politics and economy should uh, read. Anyway, thank you so much uh, for your participation and thank you audience uh, for uh, sticking with us. Uh, even if, um, and I hope that uh, we'll continue our conversation in uh, one forum or another going forward. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>